Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm uh, here to introduce uh, Chang Xu to you. Uh, Chang is uh, going to be giving his interview talk on mobile application performance optimization. He is a fifth year student uh, graduating uh, by end of April. And he has worked on cellular network characterization and mobile application optimization. And he interned with us uh, two years ago and uh, has also worked uh, with other people in MSR to develop uh, 3G test, which won the FCC Open Challenge Award uh, in the area of network measurement applications. And um, um, without further ado, here's Thanks. Chang. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, thanks for joining the talk. I'm very happy to be here today to present in our research effort about mobile application uh, performance optimization through network infrastructure aware adaptation. Uh, unlike some uh, existing performance adaptation techniques, ours are more, familiar, are more aware of cellular network or unique uh, characteristics of cellular network infrastructure. Uh, the truth is that since last year, smartphones have overtaken feature phones uh, on the market of cellular network device. And on those smartphones, the traffic generated by those web applications start to dominate HTTP traffic rather than web browsers. The increasingly powerful and po popular smartphone devices do not necessarily guarantee acceptable mobile application performance. So very often when we use those applications, our interaction with the application will be easily interrupted by broken network connectivity or slow network connection. Even with acceptable network performance uh, without uh, utilizing the cellular network uh, or the computation resource very carefully, those applications will have energy consumption much higher than we can expect it. When we see uh, acceptable performance, the performance actually refers to end-to-end -end performance. So we know that end-to-end -end performance is affected by a multitude of factors. The network, the device, the application, the implementation will all affect the application performance. For example, in network, the routing, the topology, the naming, addressing, resolution, all of them will affect application performance. Besides network, the application is affected by the hardware, the software, the application implementation. There are so many different types of applications. Different types of applications have very different resource utilization requirement. So we, we expect those applications will have different performance. Even for the same type of applications, they uh, use different optimization resource adaptation technique. So we can see c sometimes we, they, they dif their performance differ significantly. So what we want to do? In our research, we want to improve mobile application performance. Again, we want to use those opti optimization adaptation techniques, but different, but different from existing or previous optimization techniques. We want to do something different. We, do, we are more aware of those fundamentally unique characteristics in cellular networks, such as radio uh, routing restriction issue, performance variation issue, and radio inefficiency. So the workflow for our research is about we identify some unique characteristics in cellular networks. Then we determine, we try to determine, OK, the impact of those individual factors on the application performance. Then when we develop or design those optimization techniques, we take those into consideration. Let's have a look at what has been done so far. In 2011, we have a project named the Yellow Page. In this project, we identified routing restriction issue in cell networks. Then we investigate what's the impact of this routing restriction issue on latency sensitive applications such as CDN. After that, we have uh, a project NetPiculate and its follow up project. In this project, we identified or reverse engineered some middle box policies in cellular network. 
and we investigate the impact of such middle, middle box policy on networking applications. Besides, we also have a system named AccuLock, which addresses a particular issue faced by cellular network operator when we want to localize network performance to lower aggregation levels, such as RNC or base station level. Very recently, we started to work on a project named the Plural Routing. We anticipate that in the future, internet mobility will dominate, will, will dominate the future internet. And so we, want, we, we propose some uh, inter-domain routing plus with some internet uh, architecture features to uh, keep inter-domain inter routing flexible, scalable, scalable, still incremental, deploy, incremental deployable upon BGP. Those projects are related with network infrastructure. On the device side, uh, we have a project named the 3D test. In 3D test, we try to isolate the impact of different factors on web application. Besides 3D test, we have a project named the Proteus. Uh, Proteus. In Proteus, we identify the predictability of cellular network performance in the time granularity of seconds. Then we try to see how much benefit we can achieve if we want to leverage such predictability for real-time interactive applications. Real-time interactive application is just one type of application. For other type of application, that's, those are non-real-time interactive. We have uh, Infinity. Infinity is a scheduling framework that schedule uploading and prefetching requests for applications and take energy efficiency into consideration. If, if we want to move beyond optimizing a single application to many applications, we need to understand okay, the usage patterns of those applications. So we have a diversity project. Diversity is a measurement uh, study to tr uh, try to understand the usage patterns of all the applications that we can observe in cellular networks. For a cellular network operator, if they want to understand app usage, if they want to identify applications, the first thing they need to do is, for all the network flow, they need to know which application originates each network flow. So Flower is such a system that it helps cellular network operators to identify those real-time network flows to the app at, to the applications, individual applications that originate such, app, such traffic flow in real time with, super, with minimize supervised learning effort. Are these, uh, how many of were your projects primarily compared to the ones in your group that you were associated with? Uh, this one, the yellow page one, Infinity Proteus. Diversity, Aculoc, and Flower. But you're not associated. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> for, those, for, for those projects. I'm the uh, I'm the lead student. For others, I'm involved. Uh, for three tests, as you know, uh, I'm the major contributor, as well. But in this talk, I'm only going to focus on two of them: Proteus and the yellow page. In Proteus, we worked on two problems. First, we uh, quantified or we identified the predictability in cellular network performance, particularly in the time granularity of seconds. And then we, we investigate, OK, how much benefit we can see if we leverage such predictability for real-time interactive applications. We know mobile user experience can be significantly enriched by those real-time interactive applications, such as VoIP, VoIP, video conferencing, online gaming, and even potentially popular products based on head-up display, such as Google Glasses. Five years ago or 10 years ago, when we start, started to use smartphones, Windows Phone, iPhone, or BlackBerry, at that moment, the computation capability or network te technology even couldn't support voice over, or VoIP well. But now we think, in, or even or in the future, we expect such applications will play a more important role. But we know those applications are very performance sensitive. So let's have a look at how sensitive those applications are to network performance. A very common feature has been overlooked by us for those real-time interactive applications is that those applications can actually tolerate to bad network, bad network condition to some degree. 
For example, they can add forward correction to prevent information loss. They can adjust the jitter buffer size to smooth jitters. They can even vary the source coding rate to lower down the requirement on the network bandwidth. But those adaptations assume that, OK, the network performance, the network change is somewhat can be estimated or somewhat predictable so that they can adapt to the performance change. They can do adaptations. If the performance change is in any arbitrary way, then performance degradation will happen. But we know in several networks, performance variation is really high. At this moment, round trip time can be up to 100 milliseconds. But in the immediate next moment, can be 200 milliseconds or even higher. So let's have, have a look at some numbers related with uh, cellular network performance variation. We have a public available application, measurement application named MobiPerf, also known as 3G test and 4G test, which was developed in the collaboration with Microsoft as well. Based on the measurement collected from uh, 300K users in the US, we see in 3G networks, the round trip time is around 200 milliseconds, with standard deviation 150 milliseconds. So the variation is really high, similar for throughput. Even for LTE networks, the performance is relatively better. But see the, see the round trip time is 20 milliseconds, but see the standard deviation is up to 50 milliseconds. Sure. So you think that 20 milliseconds is the median? Uh, this is the median, median. This is the standard deviation. So, so, so these numbers conflict directly from yeah. your 4G test paper in Mobius, right? Uh, where, where you're showing there, the median was about 70 milliseconds, you know, and then the uh, standard deviation was quite a bit lower than 50. Right, that's paper for, three, for, 40 for the 40 test paper. That paper we measure using a Verizon phone in our local, in our local like location because at that moment we only have LTE just deployed for Verizon. And for 40 test, the application it collects measurement from the NTI United States. This is computed based on the measurement from the US users. One is the local number, one is the overall number. Graph was that it was it was covering more than local tests, but I'll I'll double check that. Sure. And uh, just to clarify, the first number is the median or the mean? Uh, the first uh, number is the median, and this is, the second number is the standard deviation. Uh, yeah. I do want to uh, sort of point out what Sharon did. We've actually done a bunch of experiments right here for a different project. You know, we were involved with the 3G test and all this stuff, but we did our own thing, and these numbers don't pan out. The numbers we are seeing in Washington state with a quite, quite a lot of measurement do not say 20 milliseconds they're more in the direction of 70 milliseconds i think uh, yeah i think it's true that those numbers will differ based on locations uh but right but, but then if you present it as this this is sort of uh you know contrary to that if you want to present it then you might want to put some caveats in there too right okay yeah because because a, a lot of our calculations based on, this, on, this, on a lot of the systems that we build are based on some rules <coughs> of thumbs and the rules of thumb say approximately 70 mm -hmm. milliseconds is what and, and, and also keep in mind that um, the speed test data um, shows that uh, in the U.S. for LTE, uh -huh. the median is around 10 to 12 megabits per second on the down, down link. Down link. Okay. Yeah, so that's confirmed that when we do measurement, some, it depends on the location, depending on, yeah. the, on the data set. So, okay, regardless of the actual numbers, we inspire that the High variation is a nature, still is a nature for cell networks. And given the high variation, it pushes us to think that reliable adaptations for those performance sensitive applications, for those real time interactive applications, may always be necessary in cellular networks if we want to let those applications run well on a smartphone device. So, what problem do we address? We first want to figure out if there is any predictability in cellular network performance, or in other words, what performance metrics are predictable, or how strong predictability they have, particularly in the time granularity of seconds, because we want to let real-time interactive application to adapt to such predictability. Then beyond that, we position, we want to position the predictability in applications. We want to see how to efficiently do the prediction in real time, and how to support those applications with, with the performance prediction, and then eventually how much benefit we can achieve to, to let those applications have performance predictions. There are several challenges we need to address. First, there are so many hidden factors in the networks or 
on devices. Wait, the network congestion, the network congestion level, the load balancing, the resource allocation scheme, they are totally unknown to us. Without knowing such information, it's difficult for us to develop some sophisticated performance model to do the prediction. So what we do is we use regression trees. We hit, treat all those hidden facts together as a black box. We let the regression trees automatically learn the performance patterns, then do the prediction. One advantage of using regression trees is that it saves us great effort in projecting the performance model or in tuning the parameters. The second challenge is the cost of learning predictability for real-time interactive applications. For real-time applications, even without, say, without the real-time constraint, we can do whatever necessary. We can do active probing. We can, we can do offline training. But for real-time applications, um, since uh, we know that the nature, the high variation is a nature of the cellular network performance. So to support this application, we think the prediction has to be uh, continuously in real time and lightweight. So what we did is we passively monitor the traffic. So do you, uh, do you use this domain per device? Per flow. Per flow? Yeah. Per TCP flows? Uh, Per flow, uh, UDP flows actually, I'll talk about later. I know, but uh, the, the performance you learn, is that specific to a single device or specific to a set of devices? Um, the performance is actually a performance model. It's not a limited device, but the scope of the performance model only covers the short time period. So it's not necessary, it's not necessary to cover a device at, at a time. I think I will introduce later, maybe has a better understanding. So uh, we passively monitor the traffic generated by, by, those, by the applications. Uh, the assumption we have is that since we are doing the prediction at the time granularity of seconds, the co those context information like the location, the user time, the congestion level in the network should be fairly stable. So we, so we think the traffic, gen the traffic pattern of this application sh at this time granularity should be very stable. That's why we use passive monitoring rather than active probing. The third challenge is the awareness to predictability. Assume that eventually we can okay, predict, predict the performance metric fairly accurately. We still need to feed those applications with the performance prediction. So we, oh. so, uh, so we, have a, we implement a forecast library to feed those applications with performance cost. The library name is Proteus. Let's ha let us have a look at what has been observed in previous studies to collect some confidence on the performance predictability. We know that the resource allocation happens at each aggregation level in cellular network, the base station level, the RNC level, or the GGSN level. So we expect that there should be some predict predictable patterns, either resource pattern or performance pattern. In the time granularity of hours, uh, there are dynamic patterns in network load, which has been observed by many pi papers, such as a single a Sigmatrix paper in 2011. And in the shorter time granularity of minutes, the switchboard paper uh, in Mobius is from Microsoft as well. They observed that somewhat the latency uh, can be predictable or has some predictability at a time scale of 15 minutes. In a further shorter time granularity of hundreds of milliseconds, there is a Mobicom paper observed that a divide tend to stay in the same modulation rate for hundreds of milliseconds. To us, for us, the most suitable time granularity is seconds because we are targeting for real-time interactive applications. For example, a typical chunk size for adaptive bit rate streaming can be two seconds. In order to verify the predictability at the second time granularity, we run some control experiments. In the control experiments, we collect the more than 400 of hours, more, more than 400 hours of packet trace. It covers three cellular network operators, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile. And also, um, it, for device type, it covers Android and iPhone. 
We didn't succeed on Windows Phone because at that moment for Windows Phone 7, it doesn't support TCP dump or other package sniffer. We ran most of our experiments in Ann Arbor. Some of them were collected in Chicago. One thing to mention that we run most of our experiments over UDP instead of TCP because TCP already has congestion control and the retransmission. We, when we do performance predictability, we want to have the maximized visibility to network performance. That's why we rely on UDP. So I have a question about the previous slide. Um, so, so 400 plus one hour packet traces is nice. Um, uh, can you give me a sense for like the locations? Like, where did you do them in one spot in both of those locations, or did you do it in, in both of those cities, or did you do it in multiple positions in those two cities? So, for yes, for the location, for for each location, for Chicago, we do just at one spot. For Ann Arbor, we do at several network locations. For example, office, apartment, library. We we did collect several. So I should think with those you know, five, seven locations, not like 20, 1,500 locations? No. Okay. Did, did the location move during the one hour trace, or was it stationary? We plan to collect some, uh, some, uh, some packet trace when they are moved, but when, the packet when, the, when we do experiments, it, since it's, uh, it may last for a while, we need to power supply during mobility. It's difficult, so we do the experiments in stationary condition. This is a quick evidence showing the performance predictability at time granularity of seconds. So we, comp we here this we are showing the distribution of auto correlation coefficient. The co the correlation is we compute the correlation at this time moment for in the throughput at this time moment. The correlation between the current throughput and the throughput, let's say t seconds ago, and t is a time lag. So given a time lag, we know the auto correlation coefficient for one flow. Since we have so many flows, we have distribution given for each given time lag. And we show the distribution based on percentile values. Apparently, somewhere around one second, we can see the auto correlation coefficient is non-zero. But if we move the time lag to 20 seconds, the auto correlation coefficient is close to zero. It's too hard to, it's hard to tell. So one lesson we learned from this figure is that the performance, the current performance is highly correlated with the performance, most recent performance. But for the history, say 20 seconds ago, the correlation is already weak to tell. That's why I see it's not specific to a location because at this time, 20 seconds, the location may not, the, the location probably is still the same or specific, or specific to a device. So we just do performance modeling at this time granularity. So at what time of day or day of week do you do this? Or do you do this across different time of day and day of week? We do different time of day. But later I will show it's not actually affected by time of day issue much. So we think in our 400 packet traces, we do collect experiments over different time of day. We didn't specify peak hour or non-peak hour. One of the conclusions that you're drawing from this graph, which mm -hmm. is that the um, that you believe based on this, um, the location doesn't matter, and um, and the reason I disagree with you on that is because I think in conditions where your signal strength um, gets particularly poor, mm -hmm. um, or or there can be interference from either other devices that are on the same spectrum or or not, or you know, um, that's what's other happening. Places, to okay, uh, but but also it, it sort of contradicts with your previous assertion on the numbers on LTE, for instance, mm -hmm. where you're talking about, well, those previous numbers were from lab experiments, mm -hmm. and you know, we, should, we should be looking at numbers from, from broader scale experiments. So, so can you tell us philosophically you know, why in this situation um, we should believe those lab numbers, whereas when looking at overall LTE performance numbers, we should focus on a broader set of data, such as from 4G tests? Um. You mean when we, when we for, for example, for LT numbers, which we should be rely on more like the lab experiments or the uh, broad experiment collective? Yeah, yeah, just, just tell me philosophically, like, which, which is a better choice in one situation, such as 
collecting LT performance numbers and looking at those and, and looking at very fine-grained information like this for I think, predictability. I, I think eventually the RTM will go is try to optimize for application performance. So it depends on the needs. Even with the granularity for the optimization, see, it's just uh, very broadly, like such as CDN service, this we don't care about. Okay, the performance measure is from the la we we probably more care about the performance measure uh, broadly over the over the country. But if we are here currently focus on ap that application, the granularity is about second. Then probably we care more about the experiments collected in lab because see we see the variation, the variation, the time granularity, the time um, dimension for the variation is we see at this moment, at next moment. So it covers seconds or minutes. So probably from that perspective, lab, the measurements collected from lab is also valuable. And there is also maybe some logistic difference in these two experiments. In the 4G test, as you are focusing on uh, basically overall Why don't we add the value. Value. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we so are, basically uh, that data about is small. Not your yeah, fine grand <laughs> basically Jane, Jane, granularity. Jane, Jane. I have another question. Um, so, what is the so LTE has a scheduling algorithm underneath it, in which you know you've got packets coming into the queue, and then LTE, you know, or sort of a master slave thing will sort of schedule it. So, how much of the effect do you see inside uh, these numbers? Because you know you, you've got 0 0.5 seconds, and this might actually be with the way LTE is scheduling the packets to the client as opposed to the real correlation sort of, for example, you're saying. And that, that actually depends on how the packets are being sent to the base station or to the, to the client, right? So uh, is, is the way you will parse that out a little bit more? Uh, you mean how much contribution of the scheduling uh, in the cell network affects the overall performance, right? So I think for 3G, that, that's definitely a uh, very, very big uh, impact. And for LTE, the impact uh, for those scheduling is low. Um, but in term, that's in terms of absolute value. That means when we see the, sc the scheduling in cellular network, in, in LT networks, uh, compared with wireline, it's not, it's not the bottleneck, but still it affects the variation. So here, we collect the experiments using control experiments. Is Do you have any numbers or uh, how the different devices differ? Uh, are they uh, you mean uh, over different types of device? Uh, we we carried out experiment iPhone and Android. We didn't see clear difference in terms of predictability. Okay. Um, we collect experiments from 400, more than 400 packet trees. But if we want to make, as I said, conclusive, con a representative conclusion, we need to figure out the root cause so that we can apply this conclusion. On, we can think this conclusion is a common feature in cellular networks. At the time granularity of seconds, the, we know that the user, the congestion level will be, uh, sh should be stable, very likely to be stable. And we think the performance is highly affected by uh, the radio resource allocated to the device by the base station. And the base station allocates the radio resource based on proportional fare scheduling. It balances between the device with the best network condition and the fairness among devices. The base station has motivation to encourage a device to occupy continuous time slot to finish the transmission. And we did some survey on some Infocom papers and some base station vendor manuals. We see the aggressiveness factor for the, for the base station to do proportional file scheduling is, a, is as small as 0 0.001. That means a base station encourages the device to occupy the channel for a certain amount of time. And if we do a quick back of envelope analysis, the time for the device to occupy the same channel will be roughly the time slot for the allocation divided by the aggressive, aggressiveness factor, which is 0 0.001. And based on division, it will be 1.67 1. divided by 0 0.001. It's around one second. So that makes us confident on seeing there is predictability of performance, uh, of cellular network performance. Once we are convinced about the pre predictability, we start to design uh, the regression trace to learn performance patterns. 
intuitively, the input of the regression tree will be a history window. The performance patterns in the history, then we predict, OK, what's the performance in the next time window. And in the history window, we split the time into individual time window. For each time window, we know the throughput, the delay, the loss rate. And based on the, based on the, based on the performance in the history window, then we predict the loss, the, the delay, or the throughput. And we also know that the current performance is mostly correlated with more, most recent performance, rather than performance 10 seconds ago or 20 seconds ago. So we use exponential backoff. That means the input of the regression tree will be the performance in the previous one-time window, two-time windows, four-time windows, eight-time windows, or so forth. To choose the size for the time window or the history window, for time window, we choose half seconds because we are targeting for real-time interactive applications. For history window, we choose for 20 seconds because from the previous figure, we see the correlation between the current performance and the one 20 seconds ago is too weak to tell. But definitely, those parameters are subject to tune. Now we know the design of the regression tree. We run the regression tree over all the packet traces. We want to see what's the performance, what's the pr prediction accuracy. We do prediction and training simultaneously. That means once we, ha we can see a complete history window, which is 20 seconds, we can do prediction immediately. We evaluate the prediction accuracy by comparing the predicted performance metrics with the actual performance metrics based on the packet traces. To have a baseline of the prediction accuracy, we compare with two adaptation solutions. One is uh, AD1 and AD2. AD1 always estimates the performance of the next time window based on the current one. And AD2 is less aggressive. It estimates the performance of the next time window based on the average of a history window. So let's see the prediction accuracy. Here, the, we are showing the prediction accuracy for loss occurrence, not loss rate. For loss occurrence, a false positive happens in a time window if, okay, if the prediction, uh, if we predict there are packed loss, but actually there is no. We can see the false positive rate. For Proteus, the red curve is consistently low. It's no more than 2%. But for the other two solutions, for AD1, it's up to 3 to 20%. For AD2, it's even up to 80%. Actually, which is, this is expected because for AD2, it's assuming the current performance based on the, performance in, the average performance in history. But we know the, the performance correlation between the history performance, such as 10 seconds or 20 seconds ago, is already, it's already too weak. Similarly for false negative, Proteus is here. It's, our, uh, it's a little bit overlapped with, the, with, the, with AD1 and AD2. And the, it, False negative is still consistent low. It's one to two percent. It's always it's also the best. Besides binary prediction, say loss occurrence, we can also uh, predict the exact numbers for throughput, loss rate, and delay. The exact numbers can help application to adjust the legacy uh, for error correction. So I have a question about the previous slide. Mm -hmm. So the blue line on the left-hand side graph. This one. Right, so false positive rate for that is like almost 100%. Does it mean that if you, there's a, some kind of negative correlation of what they say, like Not the algorithm said it's the positive, and if you just flip the whatever decision, then maybe you get... <laughs> so. I think this figure can explain. So for this figure, we, sh we, we, sh we see that the performance at this moment, the correlation between the performance at this moment and this moment is too weak to tell. So that means if we say if we do estimate performance based on the average history, that will be really inefficient. See the correlation is almost zero. So that means even we do estimation, just a base naive estimation, it still we need to look at a very short time window. Otherwise, it won't be helpful. I think Jane's point is that if the correlation is zero, you expect it to be fifty percent. Right. Right. Exactly. Huh. Let's see. 50%. If you just randomly predict 
predict that you know you will have probably fifty percent of false positive rate, right? Uh, I think what's missing is that you haven't defined here what you mean by false positive. Do you mean is it is it an accurate prediction if it's within X milliseconds of what the true latency is? What, uh, what, is what, what's your definition of false positive? Isn't that the definition? I think. Yeah, I but think, actually not. But does that mean that it has to be exactly correct? I think it won't be fifty percent. It will be fifty percent if we quantitatively do the predict predict the loss rate. But if we do the prediction for the loss occurrence in the time window, see if there is one pack loss or two pack loss, it's, we always consider it's a pack loss. So that in that case, that will be fifty percent. But if we just predict a loss occurrence, it's not 50%. Well, it's a priori. What's a priori? Meaning, I mean, what's the probability that the loss just occurs if given, without giving any information? It's not actually loss. This is the exact same. That's the loss rate. This, uh, here, I also want you to mention that the loss rate it's actually not the last rate based on packets. It's the last rate based on window. So that means the, given for this time window, if there is packet loss, we consider there is loss. So this last rate is higher than the actual pack loss rate based on, uh, based on number of packets. Also, this is also one reason why this false positive rate is not, like you said, 50%. Okay, so this figure I want to show that besides binary prediction, I, I can quantitatively predict the exact numbers. Uh, for the exact numbers, I use throughput example as example. So for each throughput, I only show uh, 15 flows in the figure by random, random sampling. Otherwise, it, the figure will be uh, very unclear. So for each flow, we show the average throughput on the x-axis. and since a flow has so many time windows, we show the average error and standard deviation of the prediction error, uh, which is, you can see the network performance varies a lot from 100 kbps to 800 kbps. But the prediction error is still uh, is very stable. It's around 10 kbps with standard deviation of 10 kbps. This is for cell, this is for 3G. Is when, we, 3G. When, we did, when we did the experiments in our location, we don't have LTE yet. Uh, but we did some quick experiments. We found for LTE, there's still predictability. And just I explained, because there is a base station scheduling. But the time window size and history window size will be different. Can you explain again what the error bars on each measurement indicate? Oh, the error bars. So for one flow, there are so many time windows, right? For each time window, we have a prediction. So aggregating all the time windows, we have a distribution of the prediction error, the average, the median, or the standard deviation. So for each flow, I show one bar. This is the, this is the average and standard deviation. And the x-axis, I'm showing the average throughput of the flow. I'm, I want to show over so diverse natural condition, the performance prediction so is stable. Mm -hmm. The prediction errors, not prediction values, we predict compared with the actual one because we have the packet trace. We know the actual performance. Right, but I mean, those, those error bars of, are of the prediction, not of actual measurement comparison. This is show, the arrow is, is using the predicted throughput minus the actual throughput, and we, and we see. Uh, the difference, not, the, not just the minus, because it can be negative. So we show the difference here, and then we show uh, the, me, the, the average of the difference and the standard deviation of the difference. For each throughput value, you have multiple experiments. Actually, for, not for each throughput value. For all the flows, we have different throughput values. It, is, it will be distributed over the x-axis, but I only show 15 of them to make the figure clear. Are they different flows? Are they same? What is it? 
So, How so fast four, are you generating the packets? The more, ha more, more than 400 packet flows we collect in our control experiments. So they're all different? They are different because at different time of day. And you don't, you, do you know how to characterize the flows themselves? How to what? I'm sorry. Characterize the flows of how fast packets are being, bits are being generated. Oh, yes, decide the UDP sending rate, you mean. It's actually difficult. Like for a gap, previous gap, when the gap ran over UDP, it first do TCP probing to estimate the network bandwidth, then do UDP. We did a very similar thing. At each TC, uh, do, be, before each experiment, we ran a short time TCP to roughly estimate what's the network condition. Then we send UDP at this, at this sending rate. Were you able to bucketize to sort of figure out a certain characteristic flows achieves whatever error bars versus others, or is it just all over the place here? Okay, I'll see your question again. I don't, I don't understand. So if your flows are of different characteristics, right? Uh -huh, yeah. Generating bits are different from. Yes. Then you're gonna when you when you measure all this stuff, it may be different, because again, you know, if a packet, if the queues are filled up, and it, versus they're not filled up, depending on how fast the network is responding below mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. So you need to sort of say this is the kinds of flows which achieve. This is the kinds of errors versus some other kinds of flow achieve certain other kinds of errors. Unless of course you have. <coughs> Uh, confidence that all the flows are pretty much very similar to one another, and so in which case we can actually look at these bars and say, okay, this is what's telling us. Yes, I think for all for all those flows, those flows collected at different time, different location. That's why distribute distribute they distributed over the x axis. They have different characteristics, definitely, but we also show that in terms of different characteristics, the prediction error, roughly. Roughly, uh, the prediction, the, the error of the prediction in terms of average and standard deviation, roughly the same, roughly stable. We, I just introduced how to, uh, how to build, how to construct regression trees uh, to show the existence of predictability and uh, prediction accuracy of using regression trees. So next I'm going to show how to leverage such predictability in applications. First, we use the socket wrapper to add uh, sequencing information because for regression trees, the very important information to compute the performance metrics is uh, packet sequencing and timing information. See, if a sender wants to send XYZ to the receiver, the XYZ through the socket wrapper, we add sequencing and timing information. Over the network, the, the receiver says socket wrapper will see the sequencing timing and extract the sequencing timing to the performance to the regression tree and extract the content, forward the content of XYZ to the application. This is, uh, this is all, all, our very original design for, for to, to collect the packed sequencing and timing information. We think this way probably is applicable to most type of applications. So we think this, this this solution can potentially maximize the applicability. And once the regression tree has the uh, packet sequencing and timing information, it fits to the application. The application, for example, can adjust the digital buffer size and also send other information to the, to the, sender, to the sender side. So the sender will get, uh, the, for example, the loss, the throughput to adjust the forward error correction, for example, do the adaptation. And, but we know that many sensitive applications already include sequencing or timing information. So we extend our solution a little bit as well. For those, we, we know those applications have sequencing timing information. Why don't you just let those applications feed the regression tree with the sequencing and timing information? This way it minimizes the overhead of without bothering the socket wrapper. Very recently, uh, we, 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 think, we realized that many of those applications, real-time interactive applications, they use re RTP. RTP already has sequencing and timing information, and it's our, we can easily locate those sequencing and timing information just using libpcap. And li using libpcap, the application can just send and receive as they were without knowing Proteus library, and just get performance prediction from the Proteus library. So we think this, the very, oh, the very recent design, potentially maximize the transparency to applications. Now we evaluate the 
benefit of such predictability using video conferencing. Uh, video, conferencing the, the video conferencing application does two things. First, it collects a performance prediction from different prediction solutions like Proteus, AD1, or AD2. One issue is that since we are comparing across those different prediction solutions, how to guarantee the natural condition is the same. <coughs> Once it gets a performance prediction, it adjusts the source coding rate, the forward error correction, and the digital buffer side to make performance adaptation. There is a standard approach on desktop. We can use H.264 reference software to achieve that. But currently, there is no such open source platform to, uh, for, for open source encoding, decoding platform for mobile. So we did three things to address those issues. The goal is to achieve equivalent mobile video conference setup. First, we modified the H.264 reference software to enable per-frame adaptation. That means for each frame, we can adjust the source coding rate, the amount of FEC, forward error correction, and the digital buffer size. Then we run the modified H.264 reference uh, software on a laptop. This is our limitation, actually. We run it on laptop, and in order to guarantee that different, different solutions, different predict solutions have the same have reproducible network conditions. We replace those 400 packet traces with dynamically encoded uh, content over different prediction solutions. Let's see how we do that. This is an example of the original packet trees we collected in our control experiments. And in each packet, we have a sequence number, timestamp, and a random uh, placeholder, a random content in the packet. On the receiver side, we periodically, the receiver periodically send those, those placeholder packets. In our experiments, those placeholder packets are some random values. But in our evaluation, we refill those placeholder packets with the predicted loss throughput or latency using different prediction solutions. On the sender side, once it sees a prediction, prediction packet, it computes the source coding rate and the forward error correction accordingly, encode the frame according to the uh, source coding rate, then replace the content of those, those random content with a newly encoded content. So we can evaluate the, the perceptual video quality on the receiver side. This is a quick example in visual comparison between Proteus AD1 and AD2, and also TCP. I'll explain later how we compare with TCP. This is a quantitative comparison. We use fifth percentile PSNR to show the vi vi perceptual video quality. And similarly, for, for each flow, we have a distribution of PSNR. We show the fifth percent, 50, fifth percent of PSNR because we think it reflects user dissatisfactory more. We can see for Proteus, and OPT means opt hypothetical optimal. They are very close. The hypothetical optimal is that at this moment, I always know the performance in the next time window. So I can add forward error correction, I can adjust the digital buffer size, and adjust source coding rate. You can see they are almost identical, just slightly worse. Definitely it's much better than AD1 and AD2. We also compare with TCP, but there is an issue how to guarantee the same network condition between TCP and UDP. What we do is for each TCP flow, we, found, we try to find the most similar UDP flow based on average throughput. Then we show on the figure to compare with different solutions. For TCP, it's even worse than the case without performance uh, prediction. That's actually uh, well known. It's roughly 20 dB. The previous fifth percentile PSNR. So how do you ensure the natural condition? I cannot ensure for TCP and UDP, for each TCP flow, I search for, I try to find out, okay, which UDP flow is the most similar to the current TCP flow. So I based on average throughput. Yeah, but even for the UDP flow, how do you 
uh, <coughs> make sure the network condition across different like AD one, AD two, or approaches are. That's how we do here. <coughs> Wait for different prediction solutions. This is original packet trace. In the original packet tree, we have placeholder packet. Those are placeholder packet uh, filled with random values at the very beginning. But when we do prediction, we pred using different prediction solutions, we refill those packets with a performance prediction. But this is uh, not running on the real mobile network. This is under some controlled experiment. <coughs> is that right? This is controlled experiments because we want to guarantee same network condition. So we replace those packed trees collected in several networks previously and see over those packed trees how much uh, benefit we can achieve. Have you run any experiment on the real mobile networks? On real mobile networks, um, there's another difficulty is the encoding decoding stuff doesn't work on mobile platform. Currently, it only works on desktop. We tried to cross compile that. We didn't succeed. What about with uh, USB dongle? With USB dongle, that's possible. That's definitely. Yeah. I mean, have you run this over? We can run this over those USB dongle. But the problem is that, again, we cannot guarantee the same network condition. We can see we receive the video quality. We receive the video. Yeah, but uh, if your scheme is better than without prediction, then if you run it over enough time, uh, then you should yeah. see a statistical difference, significant difference yes. between the two. Yes. Have you done any of that? Mm, we just did a very simple test. We, didn't, we don't have enough number of uh, repeat, re, re, repeated experiments to show. It's not much different from running your like, UDP probes. You just run it for some time over some location and repeat it over a different time of day, then you should be able to see some difference between the two. Uh, should it be? <coughs> uh, actually, if there, is no, if there is no such limitation of running those encoding, decoding suite on uh, on mobile platform, definitely we will do that. Just so uh, there is no such such thing on mobile platform, so we think just why don't you just uh, let using packet trees replaying to show the comparison across different prediction solutions. Uh, the fifth per, the fifth percentile show more like uh, the quality video quality affected by loss. That means we the predict loss is lower than the actual loss. So we lost a, we lost a frame. Then we see bad video quality. We also want to show how if we overestimate the say the pack the, the pack loss rate, we add more forward error correction. If we might add more forward error correction, it wastes network resource and energy definitely. So we want to show. We want to compare the FEC overhead due to overprotection. The bottom part is actually uh, the necessary forward error correction need to add to prevent uh, information loss. And the, 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 the top part is showing the additional forward error correction. For Proteus, it's around 5 kbps. And for the other two, roughly, you can tell, 20 kbps, even higher. So in Proteus, again, we did three things. We first, to verify or confirm the predictability of several network performance at the time granularity of seconds. Then we designed the Proteus to provide uh, applications with performance forecasts. Then we evaluate how much benefit we can achieve by leveraging such, such performance predictability. It's almost identical to hypothetical optimal. It's a, it's a little. Uh, overestimated because we replace the trace rather than do the computation on mobile device. And if we compare with existing uh, adaptation solutions, we, in terms of PSNR, we have 15 dB improvement. Hello, previous slide. When you say prediction accuracy uh, delay, what, what, in, what are the error bars on the, the delay and the and is the loss there a loss rate, or just whether you lost the packet in that half second? Here, I only show the result based on loss occurrence. That means for 100 time windows, for 98 of those time windows, we can predict if there's any packet loss or if there's no packet loss. For each time window, is it half second? For each time window, it's half second. Okay. What about delay? What delay, is, delay is similar thing. Uh, if delay is higher than 
the human tolerable delay, say 150 milliseconds, then we consider, similarly to loss, we consider, it's a, we consider false positive and false negative. Also, we can quantitatively predict those numbers as well. But this here, I'm just to show the binary prediction. So if you were to try and actually predict the, the loss rate, mm -hmm. how, how would these numbers look like? I mean, uh, you mean quantitatively predict the loss rate? Yeah, so, so rather than not predicting a binary, yes, there will be loss or there won't be loss in a half second window. It will be, it will be very close to the actual loss rate. That's why from, this fi from the previous figure, we, sa we say it's almost identical to the, op to the hypothetical optimal. Otherwise, it will be lower than, than, the, than the blue points. The second project I'm going to introduce, quickly introduce, is a yellow page. In this project, we identified the routing restriction issue in several networks. You may already have known at this moment, but at that moment is unknown to most of us. And we investigate the impact of such routing restriction issue on latency system sensitive applications such as CDN. The motivation for the project is actually from the observation about cellular network, cellular IP dynamics. This figure is showing this observation. So for all those blue points, it's showing the geolocation of a single cellular IP address. You can see the single cellular IP address geolocation over time can cover the entire southeast part of the United States. In comparison, we plot the location of an uh, internet IP address. It's limited to a pinpoint on the map. So we want to figure out what's the reason here, what's the reason for the cellular IP dynamics. And we think this may affect those typical IP-based applications on the internet. So let's review uh, the cellular network infrastructure. This figure is showing the important network elements uh, along the path from a smartphone to the internet. Um, the base station, the RNC, and GGSN. According to 3GPP, GGSN is a gateway uh, for, uh, it's the first uh, IP, uh, IP hub from the, on the path from the smartphone to the internet, where IP allocation happens as well. So we think there must be something related with GGSN that results in the cellular IP dynamics. So to to specify our problem, we want to deter, de determine the internal of cellular network infrastructure, starting with inferring the placement of GGSN inside the cellular networks. And we expect this will be the root cause for the cellular IP dynamics. Then we investigate the implementations, implications of such routing restriction issue in cellular network. So, so by placement, do you mean uh, where? Like where geographically those GGSNs are? Actually, or, or do you mean topologically where they are? Uh, it's actually not important that it where exactly location of the GGSN placement. We are more care about the network location of those GGSNs so we know how it affects the network applications or IP-based application. So premise placement is not a physical, physically placement. But wasn't this work you did with the folks at AT&T? We, we had some observations. We confirmed with AT&T. But we, we, the solution we propose doesn't rely on AT&T's information or other carriers' information. So we have two, the challenge comes from two aspects, uh, limited visibility and epidynamics. In terms of limited visibility, when we, so an intuitive solution, when we want to discover the internal of the network, we do trace route. We do trace out from device to the internet. We found most of the uh, most of the hubs is just a private IP address without host, na host name or domain information, which is difficult for us to infer topology co-information. In the reverse direction, we do trace out from the internet to the to the phone. Very often, the probes are blocked by the firewall, the nest boxes in the middle. Another intuitive solution is that okay. I have a cellular device. I, I determine which base station connects with my 
my device, and then which RNC connects with my uh, with those base stations. Eventually, we we know which DGSN connected with RNCs to do the pro based on the propagation. But this um, those lower aggregation levels, those are transparent to us. Those are proper information for our cellular network operators. We don't know. The second challenge aspect is IP dynamics. We, in our experiments, we want to control IP address to, to, to do some experiments, but we see for a while, or even with the reset form, we will lose the IP. It will appear as somewhere far away. We don't know. So our solution is that we consider geographic coverage of IP. It's a set channel. We expect that those IPs with the same geographic patterns or same geographic location distribution should, should be highly, uh, highly likely allocated or managed by the same GDSN. So the question is that if we can determine the geographic coverage of each cellular IP address, then we can roughly infer, infer the placement of those GDSN. So the question is how to determine the geographic coverage of IPs. We use two data sets. One data set is a location search service named Yellow Page. It's very similar to Yelp. On the server side, we know the IP address of the HTTP request and the GPS location of the request. The second data set is 3D test, no need to mention. It's the, it collects the, some, like the carrier information, the IP address of the, each time the user run our experiments. Then how to infer GGSN placement based on geographical coverage. We think there should be some correlation between the GGSN placement and the geographical coverage. So once we know the geographical coverage of IP address, we group them and cluster, cluster them to, to figure out some patterns of those geographical coverage, then further investigate the GGSN placement. I'm going to show some examples. First, let's see. How do we determine the geographic coverage of those cellular IP address? In terms of number. Yeah, so, if I understand the, the top box in, in, in Ivory, you're, you're saying that you, you expect that the IP for any, mm -hmm. that the device is using for any given uh, communication that, as viewed from the public internet side is going to depend upon where the device physically is located in the world. Is, is that what your claim is for all communication on the internet? Or? Uh, we think, OK, for one IP address, it can be allocated to so many different devices. So for each IP, ad for, so for each IP address, then we can have a geographical distribution or geographical coverage. Right, but Even are you saying that the, the device will always use the same IP address no. depending on where its ge geographic location is? Or does it, there, there isn't any, what I'm questioning is, there doesn't seem to be anything in here about who it's talking to. Would, do, do, you, do you see that the, for a given device, if I have a phone here right now and I try to connect to, say, some website in California versus some website in Florida, Am I going to be using the same IP address on the public internet for both those communications, or might I go through some different egress point into the public internet that allocates a completely different IP address for that communication than another? I think you will be allocated by the same gateway. But if you use a device to see connect communicate with the server at Washington and the server let's say at Michigan over uh, the over a very long time, the, the IP address may be different. Actually, I have the same issue and, and another one. And so technically, you can have different IP addresses. So um, for each, each phone, you can have different classes of service that are essentially defined by the APN settings. So you can have multiple APNs tied to each 3G or 4G connection. And those can technically be served by different GGSNs. So you could contact different services out on the internet via different IP addresses. Um, so, so, so I think uh, your, your point is valid in that in, in some situations that can happen. I don't know whether the US operators actually do that. I do know they have multiple APNs, but I don't know if phones, I'm not aware of any phones in the US that connect to multiple APNs simultaneously. Where do the there are international APNs? ones that do do that. Where do the APNs for the architecture of the issue? Yeah, so, so that was my second question, is basically, is there an assumption here that 
all GDSNs offer the same APNs that the provider has? Because I know technically you can have, let's say we've got three APNs, you can have some GDSNs serve APNs one and two, other ones that serve two and three, and so you may not necessarily have this correlation, direct correlation between geographic location of users and what block of IP addresses they're likely to be served out. In fact, I believe there's a service where APNs can be uh, given to some corporations, right? Like private APNs. Private APNs can be done, so in which case you will see different results, I think. I think, I think first I need to clarify that how to define GGSN. If GGSN is just a single machine, then you, 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 then it's right that there are so different API and they should probably go to different single machines. But if we see GGSN probably is a cluster of machines, it's serving uh, same, roughly the same geographical area, then you can consider them together as the same GGSN cluster. So in that case, you have different APN profiles. Although you connect to different, different GGSN individual machines, but still you, you are talking with the same GGSN cluster. This, they definitely, when we design a system, we want to isolate the functionality of different GGSN, GGSN machines. Some of them may serve one APN, some of them will serve the, will serve sure. the other. That's within the data center, right? I mean, there, there's still, it's still a valid configuration to have GGSNs, a cluster of GGSNs in one data center serving a subset of APNs and GGSNs in another data center serving a, and potentially overlapping a different set of APNs. Uh, you mean at the same time? Yes. At the same, at the same time, it only happens when uh, there's, there is some, some specific service because some, there's still some motivation for a device to keep IP addresses. Then in that case, even if you move to another location, you're still talking to the original GGSN. That's probably happened in roaming. The ad, in other words, if also in another aspect of load balancing, the sometimes the, at this moment, the IP address may be allocated, managed by one GGSN. In the next moment, it may be managed by the other GGSN. So it will take time domain into consideration. That's that's I'm going to answer. Is that more than ten or is less than ten? It's less than ten. So for AT and T, it's four. four. Yeah. So it hasn't changed in the last few years. Well, uh, it's difficult to change actually. You can you can you can you can imagine they need to set up a very big data center to serve all those RNCs. Actually, I know that data center is not that large. They only have uh, several hundred machines. I search online for like Cisco if they provide such GGSN machines. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not that large. Like it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's more than we can expect it. I, I heard they claim they are going to expand their significantly in the last few years. I, I've been told that they've already expanded from the four that we saw, we saw when we did I think that's four. probably one reason why they want to acquire T-Mobile. Because if they acquire T-Mobile, they can share the network. They, they will combine those data centers together share common re, uh, network resource. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to speed up. So how to determine the geographic coverage is the first question. Uh, it's the first question. So we have a location ser ser service. We have the server logs. Uh, we have the logs from the server side. For each IP, for each HTTP request, we know the IP address. And we know the location of the HTTP request. But in terms of number of records for each single IP address, it will be small. So we aggregate the IP address in the same BGP prefix. We use RouteViews data, and the RouteViews data give us a list of BGP prefix. So we first correlate those two data sets we have for each BGP prefix. We know a couple of GPS locations. So we, for each GP, BGP prefix, we know the geographic coverage. On three tests, similarly, we know the carrier name on three tests because it's can, the application can collect such information. So for each prefix, we know who's, who's the carrier. And we correlate those intermediate uh, mapping table together. We, for each carrier, we know a list of BGP prefix and the coverage of this of the BGP prefix. So the next question is how to infer the GGSN placement based on the geographic coverage. Here I show some examples. Clearly, in the top two figures, those two figures, those those two CI24 address box share very similar geographic coverage. They are almost identical, covering the eastern part of the U.S. 
And for the bottom two, they share another geographical coverage covering the southeast part, southeast part of the US. We looked at the entire, our entire data set, we see there are only a limited, say, four or eight geographical coverage over the southern south BGP prefix. So an intuitive solution here that we, why don't we just cluster those BGP prefix based on geographical coverage. So we think they're, they're, the, if we cluster them, we can see which probably which GTSN covers which accounts for which BGP prefix. So we do clustering. I'm going to skip the details how we run those clustering algorithms, how we tune the parameters. But here, I'm, go I'm showing an example using AT&T. For each cluster, we aggregate the geographical coverage of the BGP prefix in the cluster. We can clearly see that one covering the western part, one covering the south, south, south part, one covering the southeastern and the eastern part. For AT&T, there are four GTSN clusters. For other carriers, there are roughly the same, same number for T-Mobile 6, for Sprint 8, and for, what's that? for, for, for Verizon 6. So this means that every time we set up communication between our mobile device to a remote server, it goes through some GGSN, which is far away, then reaches the, which reaches the content server. This is a routing restriction issue. We validate our, our clustering through four methods. Uh, I can give one example. For example, Diana patterns. For the BGP prefix belong to the cluster covering the western part, we count the number of records for the BGP prefix. We can see a Diana pattern. And we do the same thing for the, for the BGP prefix on the eastern part. Clearly, we see there are three hour offset. So we also use other solutions to, vali to validate our clustering result. But I'm next, I'm going to focus on the implementation, the implication of such rest routing restriction issue on latency sensitive ap applications, such as CDN. For CDN, a very important decision for their design is where to place the content. Uh, there are several options. We can place content in radio access network. I know some startup companies are working on this, but it requires infrastructure support because the IP, the, the, the inside the radio access network is lower layer than IP. And the second option is put it in cellular backhaul, the cellular IP networks. Uh, it requires approval, uh, the approval from cellular network operators. And then the, that's why currently cellular network operators, they are doing their own content uh, CDN service. For normal CDN service providers, um, a cost-effective ap ap approach may be just a place close to GGSN. But intuitively, we know the latency is most likely decided by the virus part. So even when we place the, the content close to GGSN, the benefits may be very trivial. So we want to see how much the benefit is. We do, we do some experiments. In 3G test, we send probe to the first IP hub. Then we send probe to 20 landmark servers. For those 20 landmark servers, we choose the one with the smallest latency. And we compare this smallest latency with GGSN. Here, this is, a compar this is showing the distribution of the difference. We can see even place content close to GGSN, we can roughly have six, six, six milliseconds benefits. The six milliseconds when we did the study it's very trivial because the 3G, in 3G, the, the round trip time is 100 to 200 milliseconds. Six milliseconds is too small. But in current LTE networks, we know the latency is, is reduced significantly. The six milliseconds may be non-trivial if we consider placing content close to GGSN because there are so many GGSNs. There, there are so few GGSNs. We just need to place content close to this, for example, four locations. We don't need to uh, consider other locations. So this can be a cost-effective approach. The second thing is that we know there are some inconsistent issues between the network location and the physical location. If we place the content physically close to, the, to, the, to those users, to those devices, we may May, it may be non-optimal. So we compare the latency to the first IP hub and the latency to the geographically closest, closest landmark server, and we show the difference. Placing content close, uh, geographically close to users, it will result in roughly 9, uh, 9 milliseconds additional latency. Again, this latency may be 
uh, considerable for LTE networks. So in conclusion, we, in this work, we identified the routing restriction issue in cell networks. On the, on the previous slide, can you explain why this would ever matter? I mean, it, it would seem that the, the topology closest network, the one that's got the fastest connection to the GS, GGSM, whatever, the, would, would be more important than what, what its physical location is, mm -hmm. right? In, in, in the wireless networks, there's a proximity between the network location and the physical location. So sometimes we just simply put place a content as close. I'm sorry, you said the wired or wireless? Wireline, wireline internet. There is a proximity between the network location and the physical location. So if we still place content, the si similarly, just based on the physical location, it will be not optimal. Right? <coughs> I, I, I'm, I'm still missing. It seems to me that the difference between this slide and the previous slide is simply showing that the connectivity of the landmark servers to the GS, GGSNs doesn't exactly correlate to where they're physically located, but rather correlates to what their quality of network connection is. This figure is not showing the quality of the network connection. This figure, C, we have 20 landmark servers. We do probe to those 20 landmark servers. Some of the landmark server is geographically close to the cellular device. So we see, OK, for this latency, we compare if we the latency to the GGSN, see if what's how much is the uh, latency inflation. Oh, 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 you're it's physically close, close to, to, the phone. to the phone, not yes. to the GGSN. Yes. Okay. Ah, well, that then. Well, again, why would that ever matter? <laughs> because I said in where that. I'm just talking about where the GGSNs are. I mean, you're, you're basically just showing that the GGSNs aren't oftenly placed or that there's too few of them. Or yes. The GGSN is the only one which can reach the phone for all practical purposes. The GGSN is the location of the phone. Yeah. I'm right. actually surprised that the difference isn't worse. Yeah. Right. The difference is worse compared to... I, I would have expected this graph to look worse because, because as we know, <clears throat> with a relatively small number of GGSNs, you've got a relatively large distance between where phones actually are and where the GGSN is. In reality, it should be worse because we do, for 20 landmark servers, we select the uh, we, 20 landmark servers, we, we, we choose, um, I think, for, oh, for this figure. For the previous figure, I think it should be wor worse because we do for 20 landmark servers and we select the minimum, the minimum latency. And for GGSN, we just do once. So if you do more number of probes, definitely you will, see f you will have a better chance to see smaller latency. So if we do, say, 20 probes to GGSN, we probably will see higher benefits of the, of the, of the latency. I order that, that you're trying to tell us. Um, you know, companies like Akamai already put caches in in, in, in network um, in networks. You know, so what's cache? What, what, what's something that you're telling us here? Caching can now solve all the problem, right? So they still need to. They still have the motivation to push the push the content close to the to the user as close as possible. And they, there are several options, but um, maybe the cost-effective approach is just to place content close to GGSN. If they move the content further inside the network, it will require some additional overhead. So we see, OK, how, how if we place content at GGSN, intuitively we think the benefit will be very marginal, because the wireless part, we still think dominates the latency. Here we quantify that, we see this benefit may be marginal to, to 3G networks, but in the future, in LTE, it's not the case any, it's not necessarily the case anymore. And also people are thinking about, okay, let's move the first IP hub forward to the device rather than GGSN because GGSN is too far away. If we move move the IP hub forward to close to the physical physical device, there may be other chance for us to place content. Just give people an uh, idea of placing content is not necessarily intuitive. The contribution here, uh, 
We identify the routing restriction issue in cellular networks, the conclusion that for all those major cellular network operators, they only have four to eight GDSNs. And we also investigate the impact of such routing restriction issue on latency-sensitive application, taking example as content delivery network. And we, see, we think that placing content close to GGSN is still beneficial, for, uh, particularly in the future. And the benefits can be non-trivial in LT networks. In other research projects, we have some observations maybe still beneficial, still bene beneficial to, uh, to mobile application maybe. Uh, for, for example, for NetPicket, we, we, we reverse engineered the middle boxes. And we found that some middle box policies are just uh, too aggressive. They interrupt the TCP connection uh, very, uh, very, very quickly. The interruption to TCP connection will lead to energy waste and application performance degradation. Also, in the diversity project, we found that actually 20, the, the local application, if we consider that most of the traffic, most of the content requests is from a certain geographic area, that will be a local application. We actually found that 20% of applications are local applications. So this brings up the questions how to place content too close to, for some applications. There are significant local applications, how to place content further close to, the, to those users. Maybe we require some infrastructure support. If the, if the local applications are significant. We also observe some applications are always used together. Uh, we, previously, we, op we often do optimization on a single application, but it, it may be non-optimal non if we know that the, they always inter interference with other applications. Probably, some, when we do optimization, we need to take multiple applications together. We also observed that non-trivial applications are used when the user are in, are in movement. We know that when users are in movement, there are lower layer events like handoff, and the connection will be not very reliable. So when we, when we design adaptation or as for those applications or optimization for those applications, we probably need to take reliability into consideration how to do performance adaptation for those applications since they are used, they are used very likely in mobility. We also have a system named the flower. This flower, as I mentioned, it identifies the app identity of the uh, real-time network flows in either a cellular network or enterprise network if they want to apply certain policies on the app base for security issues, for like uh, user, for content customization issues. And we found that 80 to 84 percent of those applications are identifiable without supervised learning. That's uh, in, mobile, in mobile networks. So I think overall the contribution here in, in our research is we develop optimization for mobile applications and we also address several challenges faced particularly by, ne by network operators. And for some of the solutions, they re require some effort in terms of large, large, uh, large system scalability issue. And that's all, thank you. probably close to kind of time, so uh, and people get a chance to ask questions, so thanks.